Yeah, so this is going to be a different morning. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to co-preaching with John. And two weeks ago, William introduced us to a fantastic idea of the light. And we're going to continue that conversation. Um, but this morning, before we continue that conversation, as always, I and you need help. So we're going to pray. Let's do that now. God, we ask that you open our minds and hearts so that we may understand the scriptures. Reveal your light to us. Transform us into your light. And thank you, Jesus, for being the light that lights up your world through us. We pray this in your name as you rule with the Father and the Holy Spirit as one God. Amen. So, um, what is light? Well, William did this too. He kind of he contrasted the lowercase l and the uppercase l, I think. Um, and I wanted to just start there again, just real quickly. Light is interesting to me. Uh, I suppose you could say that it's a source of energy. It's a source of uh, revelation. It's a source of clarity. It sometimes has heat. Um, it's a lot of different things. But if you think about it, it, it illuminates. It makes things more clear. It casts a vision. And then the second question that we're asking is, what does light do? Well, light reveals, and light reveals in some different kinds of ways. Sometimes it's with a flashlight when you're in the dark, and other times it's cognitive. It's things that you know in your heart and in your mind that then cause you to see the world in a different way than you would if you didn't know those things. And two weeks ago, William took us back to the beginning, to Genesis chapter 1, and I I nudged Cheryl in the middle of his sermon and I said this is unbelievable I hadn't talked to him yet and he was in some of the same verses that I was planning on being in for light revealing and it just works out really really well to make this connection so look at the yellow words in this text Um, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and now the earth was without shape and it was empty and William told us about two words from Hebrew about being without shape and being empty tohu and bohu Now, you don't have to remember the words necessarily, but I put them on the screen for you just so you can see that tohu is formless. It has no organization. Things are off the rails. Um, It needs some sort of structure. We would call it chaos. And bohu means empty or void. So you can see where where that verse translation comes from with just those two words. But fascinatingly enough, God takes care of the bohu. He is the one who fills the void. That's what the rest of the Genesis chapter 1 talks about. He fills the void with creation, which we are a part of. But what does that do about chaos? Now, some of you are getting ready to go on a little bit of a a historical journey, if you know this sign. Others, you just hang on, and somebody will tell you about it over breakfast. But this was at Opryland, and I was able to go back and find what chaos looked like from the front seat of the roller coaster. So watch 30 seconds of this. Just imagine some crazy sounds. There were some, but it was really not significant. You notice that it's pitch black. You've got things spiraling down into the depths. We often hear of things, uh, things going, descending into chaos. That's kind of what this rod did. And so you're in this room. You've got all these lights and all of these different things happening. You're in a roller coaster that's jerking and moving around. And this is the kind of stuff that you're seeing with time going by and a, a great chasm and all of this different stuff happening on the screens, and you're really kind of completely disoriented, and then it's over. But here's what's really interesting. This is what the light does to reveal to what the rod that we just looked at looks like. It's just an empty room, basically a big warehouse with traveling roller coaster going around the, the perimeter of the room. You see a man over there standing on the second level, kind of gives you an idea of the scale, and there's two screens. There's a movie screen at the top and one at the bottom. And so when the lights come on, you're kind of like, oh, okay. Well, I don't know what I was scared of. I don't know why that got so much of my attention. That's one way to have a visual uh, of how light reveals and just how light can speak into something that can totally change our perspective in a matter of just a second. So let's go back to Genesis then for a second. Um, what we should look at is what God charged us with. We came in not for the bohu part, because he took care of that, but for the tohu part. We came in to talk about being agents of light, being agents of his, being his representatives to actually help subdue the chaos. And you can see it right here in, in later in the chapter of Genesis 1 in, in verses 27 and 28. Notice what's in yellow there. Fill the, fill the earth and subdue it. 
And then the next sentence says, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and every creature that moves on the ground. But here's another interesting point about this. We're not adversarial to creation. That's not what God is saying. He's saying join him, help him, in actually subduing the chaos because the world was not perfect. Now, that's going to surprise some people. I remember the first time I was asked that in a Bible class, was after creation, was the world perfect? No. The garden was perfect, but then they're cast out of the garden. And they went out into creation that still had many, many different things going on, deserts and wildernesses and you know, murder and all kinds of other stuff. So we were, we were created to harness creation's potential and use its resources to tame the chaos and to do that co-working with God. That's what, that's what moves through the Old Testament story. Then, William took us back to, to John 1, which John, the evangelist, takes us back to the beginning. And he says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then skip down to verse 4 there. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And we sometimes don't know exactly what to do with this verse, I think. Um, we realize that it has something really powerful in it but we're not quite certain on how to phrase it. So here comes a big word that you don't have to remember, but there's this Greek term called homoousios. And what homoousios has been fought over for way, way, way longer than any of us know, like decades, centuries, is what, what is Jesus in relation to the Father, to God? The short of it is Christ was not made God out of a human, but was God from the beginning, which John 1.1 1, 1 just told us, Right? Number two, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are the same substance. They're God. And they're light, love, life, all things that are for us, for creation, the creator of everything. And so we know from the Shema, from, from Deuteronomy 6, that God is three persons. Each person is fully God. There is one God. Now, if we stop right there and we say we fully understand that, then we have a problem. Because if we can fully understand what we define as God, then that's not God. If we can fully understand what we say is God, then it's not God. Keep that in mind. It, his, his ways are above ours. His knowledge is above ours. We will one day know things that will just be, oh, well, okay, now I understand a lot more than I did. So let's go forward with this idea. They're all one, yet there's three. They're of the same stuff, substance. And then we get into something that, that uh, Jewish theology has had for a long time, the invisible and the visible. And if you think about it, there were tons more scriptures in here. I cut a lot of them out um, because, because of time constraints. But look at what we're going to look at just in a couple of spot places this morning and think about what the text is actually saying. There's an invisible Yahweh. There's a visible Yahweh. Exodus 33, 18, Moses said, Show me your glory to God. And God's answer in verse 20 is, You cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. And we say, Okay, well, no one can see God and live. That, that's a, now a biblical fact. Except if we go back up a few verses before those, in the same chapter, it states the Lord would speak to Moses face to face the way a person speaks to a friend. And we might say, well, okay, now we have a contradiction or we have some sort of problem here, right? But we don't have a problem. It's the same answer as all three of them being individual and all three of them being God. God can be invisible and visible simultaneously or in, in, our, in our words at, at the same time. So keep going. This is going to make sense here in a minute. We know another, another passage where Jacob goes and wrestles with the angel, and the text tells us that the angel is the angel of the Lord. And he wrestles with, with the man, and he asks the man what his name is, and instead of the man telling him his name, he blesses Jacob and changes his name to Israel. And there at the end of that section, uh, Jacob says he names the place Pani El, which means in Hebrew, face of God. And he, and he explains that. Certainly I have seen God face to face and have survived. Then we go over, uh, we'll go back, uh, rather, um, to Genesis 18, when the, the Lord appeared, and in the original language there, that Lord in all caps is actually Yahweh. So when God appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mari, there he looked across and he saw three men standing across from him, and then he bowed low to the ground. Whenever you see bowed low in the Old Testament, it's a reference to worship. It's, it's that being being recognized as God. So Abraham is bowing to these three individuals. Then in Exodus 3, the angel of the Lord again appears to Moses in the flame from within a bush that is not consumed. You know this story, probably. The bush is on fire, but the bush doesn't burn up. 
there's an angel of the Lord in the bush, but there's also an audible voice that comes from the, the bush in verse 5 where it says, God said, do not approach any closer. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place that you are standing is holy ground. That's a fascinating statement, both of those situations. Because if we go over to Joshua, we see Joshua getting ready to go into battle, and a man walks up, and Joshua basically says, hey, are you with us or are you with the enemy? And the man says, neither. I'm the, I'm the commander of the Lord's armies, depending on what version you're using. You might ha- know that phrase more like this. I am the leader of the, lo- of the heavenly host. You're like, whoa, you're the leader of the heavenly host. And then what does he say to him? Joshua recognizes this fact after the man says this. He bows down, offers worship. And then that man says to Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet because the place you stand is holy. Interesting, right? You got two different times that that same phrase is being used by God in two different scenes. And then there at the bottom, uh, just trying to make some, some closing continuity to this, this thought. Revelation says uh, when John sees one of the angels, he tries to bow down and worship the angel. And the angel says, no, 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 no. That's reserved for God, not, not just mere messengers. So if we've had worship that has been attributed to somebody like the angel of the Lord, like Yahweh himself, then like the commander of the armies, then that's different from just a regular angel. So so hang hang on to that. Um, I'm really hoping that when we get here to the end, you'll you'll have uh, some illumination, some revelation of light. So let's, let's look at one more, probably the most important one. Exodus 23, 20. God says that he's going to send his angel before the people to protect them. They're gonna, he's going to lead them by day and by night. We know this is the pillar of cloud, pillar of fire. But then look at how this ends. Pay careful attention to him. Some versions will say, listen to him. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Now, transgressions, another name, another word that is a synonym for that is sin, right? He will not pardon your sins. My name is in him. This is, this is very similar to when Jesus is walking on the water and he calls out to the apostles, never fear, I am that I am. He says the same thing that the angel of the Lord says at the burning bush. The fire doesn't consume the bush, the water doesn't consume Jesus, and we see that he is somebody that is representing Yahweh in a way that, that can accept worship and actually be God himself, and say some of the very same things that we see said in the Old Testament. So now there's one more big word, anthropomorphism. This is where people try to come along and say, yeah, well, we can explain all this. What's happening is this is just our feeble way of trying to explain God with human characteristics. But I don't think that's correct, because the angel is a messenger of Yahweh himself in a temporary descent to visibility for a special purpose. And if you scratch your head and say, well, okay, are we deluding Jesus? No, not at all. We're actually getting ready to magnify Jesus because what this is telling us and what the Old Testament is showing us is that God could always come and go in his creation as he saw fit to help us. He's always been the light helping us along the way, but he was able to do special purposes and then return to heaven, whether it be changing Jacob's name or working with Joshua or coming to see Abraham and and Sarah. So let's return to New Testament. Jesus replied, I've been with you for so long and you've not known me, Philip. The person who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? I find this gives me chills now because I sit there and I think, here's the Jewish audience listening to, I've been with you so long and you you don't know me? Well, he he means the incarnation, right? He means Jesus of Nazareth. But a believing Jewish person would also know that God has been with them and been seen before. And so they should see Jesus as the Messiah, as the one that was coming that the Old Testament always talked about. This is not a foreign concept. The only thing that's different is this time Jesus has emptied himself and he's put himself into the human life that he cannot leave whenever he chooses. He's been born a baby, done everything we've done, and then ultimately has to die as a human lifespan. Then John goes on to say that in him was life, and the life was the light of mankind, which we also saw back in Genesis, echoes of that. And the light shines on in the darkness, but the darkness has not mastered it. 
And then Jesus says of himself, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then in the Sermon on the Mount, he turns to us. And he says to Christians collectively, you are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. So what has Jesus enabled us to do? I think that what he's enabled us to do is to transform into the image of Christ and subdue the chaos as the light of Yahweh living inside us for the sake of the world around us, which would be a fairly good paraphrase of Philippians 2.15. That's what he's enabled us to do. Because we're in him, our, his light is in us, we're able to illuminate the darkness. And he's been with us all along, but now he's with us in a way he's more so, more fulfilled than he's ever been ever before. And we might say something like this, just as summary statements. Jesus is the reason for this Advent season. He's the reason for today. He's the reason for everything, as we just sang. And Jesus is and always has been the light. And we could end right there, but two or three more minutes, I think, will help us make a connection to what John's going to come up and talk to us about and also make some of this make a little bit more sense, maybe. Christian orthodoxy has always held firm to the basic belief that it is by looking at Jesus that one discovers who God is. That's always been there. Whether we stop and say it that way or not, it's always been a statement. And you could say, okay, great, but what about the fact that all around us looks like everything's still evil? It looks like there's still darkness everywhere. There's chaos. This is just from last weekend, as, as everybody in here knows. And I could have put a lot more stuff up here, like cancer and Alzheimer's and uh, heart attacks and all kinds of death itself, all kinds of different things. And we would say, well, chaos is still here. So what, what are we supposed to do with this? Well, basically, I think what we're supposed to do with it is that we have a choice. We can either be agents of light, agents of the kingdom, or we cannot be. And I would say that life in Christ means engaging the world, not escaping it. It's pretty easy to go out there and just hide, right? Just join the darkness and don't do anything. But Romans tells us, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so if we ask, what does light do? It reveals God. It reveals us as the children of God. And it reveals God's promised and arriving future to the world around us. And it does sometimes seem scary to do that. Maybe this is another throwback, old logo, no fear. Remember this on the back of trucks and people's ball caps and whatnot? God's telling us, don't fear, I'm with you. It says it right here. I've said these things to you that you may have peace, but in this world you'll have tribulation. There's still going to be chaos. There's still going to be stuff going on that we don't like. But one, one, uh, one scholar friend of mine said it this way. He said, you know, on the, on the journey to where we're going, it's okay to have a few speed bumps along the way if that's what we have to endure. But Jesus is asking us to, ha to trust him, to go out there and to realize that there's absolutely nothing that can separate us from his love. There's nothing that can pluck us out of his hand. There's not anything in all that list that, that is there that you probably know, some of you know by heart, whether it be angels or sword or danger or death or any of, those any of that stuff. Nothing can take us away from him. So if we go out into the darkness, we don't really have anything to fear. And then bringing it kind of to a conclusion here for my part this morning, Ephesians 5, 8 through 9, it, it, it really confirms that, that whole concept. I changed the pronouns from I to we so that it includes all of us. For we were at one time darkness, but now we are light in the Lord. Live like children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And maybe a paraphrase with a whole bunch of candles joining together. We used to be afraid of the dark until we realized that we are the light. And the dark is actually afraid of us. If we live like that, then we can go into areas that look like there's actually no hope. And to a lot of those people in those areas, they probably would agree. But if we walk in as ambassadors and agents of, of the kingdom and of Jesus, we can show that there is hope and there is something coming that uh, will defeat all the chaos and all the darkness. And then I found this to be fascinating too. A single candle can ignite a thousand others while its own light remains undiminished. In other words, it doesn't really hurt us anything to help somebody else illuminate. We can keep quiet, we can stay in the darkness, or we can be the light, and others will be the light with us. And then Martin Luther King might have said it best, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. 
And as we just went through, the world just went through, uh, ended on Friday, Hanukkah. Here's a menorah made like the tree of life. And the candle in the middle that lights the other eight candles is called the shamash. It's the candle that's the servant candle and allows all the other candles to light. And so I thought, you know, be the shamash. Jesus is the shamash. We should be the shamash. We should light the other candles. And finally, Jesus says that he's with us always. And this is probably the most fascinating thing in this study that I found. As you go back to Isaiah 7 through 9, and you can see that there's a remnant, there's a thread through all of the coming generations that God never abandons his people. He keeps a connection to the house of David. There's a king that comes from the tribe of Judah. We know him as Jesus of Nazareth. And he is Emmanuel. He is God with us like no other time God has been with us. And then as he ascends, he says he's not finished being with us. He's with us to the end. So the question is, with God with us, how does the light of Jesus shine through us? I'm sure that most of you uh, have seen this image before, yes? It's rather frustrating at times. Uh, And depending on what's happening in those circumstances, you are either going to be filled with anxiety when you see this image, or you're going to be deeply frustrated because your favorite show has just been disconnected from the uh, network. You're going to see something like this. We interrupt the regularly scheduled program to bring you this important message, right? Or it may be something like the emergency broadcast system. Either way, you are familiar with that picture, and you're also familiar with interruptions, You have either been interrupted, yes, or you, in fact, have been the interruption, depending on what the circumstances are. And interruptions can look like a lot of different things. Um, It can, uh, in any way, shape, or form, right, no matter what it looks like, though, an interruption is something that stops or hinders an activity. I love that last line. It breaks continuity with where we're headed. All right. It could be anything. Uh, it could be your conversations that are actually interrupted. Or you might be the one interrupting a conversation. Uh, guilty as charged, Susie, in our office. We have, I have blasted into many offices around here or into a conversation thinking that what I had to bring up was more important than what was being said. But your conversations can be interrupted. Meetings can be interrupted. Sporting events. Some of you, I don't know, students, maybe you were one of the ones that jumped over the fence and ran across the field during a very important game to pause the game. Or maybe it was Blake, I don't know. Um, maybe your plans have been interrupted. You have at some point been interrupted. We know what interruption is, but it's always, not always a negative thing. Sometimes things need to be interrupted. Our thoughts need to be interrupted at times. Our feelings need to be interrupted at times, or they are. Um, Our assumptions need to be interrupted. Our beliefs at times need to be interrupted. Uh, I love this. It's already been referenced a couple of times. What happened in Genesis The darkness that was all over the world, God interrupted with light. He interrupted it with light. Uh, That's what came in. So I want you to do this as we kind of move through and finish up this morning. I want you to consider the greatest interruption of all time. Now you may have an image in your head or maybe something you're thinking about, but I want you to go bigger than that, something a little more cosmic. Consider the greatest interruption of all time. Isaiah 9 predicts it. Isaiah, or the author of Isaiah, will say that people walking in darkness have seen a great light. In Matthew, talking about Jesus, they'll say that that has actually been fulfilled in Jesus. And in Luke 2, he says this child that we've been anticipating has been born. And so the incarnation of Jesus, Jesus, the Jesus event, his his birth... His life here on earth, his resurrection, his ascension, his impact on this world, on the darkness that existed, is the greatest interruption of all time. So you can think about it this way. The arrival of God's good future here, now, present on earth in a way that it's never been before is the greatest interruption of all time. And you and I get to play a part in that interruption. I love this. Divine light has interrupted the powers of of darkness. Think about it that way. I love this line. Light is one of the most ancient and most significant metaphors adopted by Christ- Christians by which to understand the significance of Jesus Christ. I feel like we've established that pretty well. But what is the connection between light and love? How on earth did we come up with that? 
Well, let's think about some shifting from that to that. So John 1, 1 through 5, it's already been referenced as well. Uh, in him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. John 14, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. 1 John 4, God is love. Uh, actually, coming out of that, Jesus will say when he's asked, what's the greatest command? Because God is love, the greatest command is to love God and love others. But Jesus doesn't leave it there. He's going to go as far in Matthew chapter 5 as to say, not only do you love the people that you know well, you've got to love your enemies. We've talked about this a little bit before. You may not have someone in this room that hates your guts. Right? You may not have a mortal enemy that you think is after you day by day, but I promise you this. You have someone in your life that irritates the stew out of you. And if you're thinking, no, I don't, then you are the person that irritates the stew out of someone. All right? In some way, shape, or form. So God says, we got to love those folks as well. Right? Yes, it's enemies. It is a little bit more impactful than that. But he says, love your enemies. Love your enemies. The defining characteristic of God is love. Not any other words. Love. It encompasses a lot, though. Jesus reveals the image and the nature of that love here on this earth. So that means something for me and you. It means that love is the dominant feature of a community like Hendersonville living in God's community or kingdom, right? So not only is God love and not only does Jesus reveal that love while he's here, that means something for the church. You and I, love is the dominant feature of who that we say that we are. If you want to turn to 1 Corinthians, go right ahead. I'm going to use this as a text to think about this. You have heard this text. Now, some of you, we've had some fun conversations about this. This was not designed as a wedding text, okay? When Paul writes these words to the church in Corinth, um, he's writing to a church that has experienced incredible division in the community. Now, it is used at weddings, and some of you have probably used it in your wedding. I've used it in a number of weddings, but hear it in its context, and also hear how Paul interrupts the conversation with love over and over again. Um, he says this, 1 Corinthians ch chapter, chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, interruption, but if, not, but if have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all the mysteries and knowledge, and if I have faith so that I can move or remove mountains, interruption, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all that I have and if I deliver my body up to be burned, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way, and it's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things, and it endures all things. Love never ends, because God never ends. But as for prophecies, they will pass away, and as for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away, for we know in part what we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, when God's good future fully comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man or grown up, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then the face to face, now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So faith, hope, and love abide, these three things. But the greatest of these things is love. It is the dominant feature of who you and I say that we are. Churches, then, are designed to be schools of love. We're supposed to be shaped by this love that Paul talks about. And we're supposed to enact this love that we are manifesting with each other on this earth in a way that it interrupts the flow of the regularly scheduled programming and you and I get to become if we choose to do so instruments of love Blake I thought about you as, we, as I was thinking through this we're called to live in a key of love with tones and notes and chords so that when you 
it's got, a, it's got a sound to it, right? So it sounds like something. There's a particular sound. Paul says it out of the opening gates in 1 Corinthians 13. Without it, you're just noise. You're just a noisy symbol. So what is our role, right? What is our mission, if you will, in this divine interruption? And it's love. Light loves. Matthew 5, Stan brought this up already. Jesus makes this statement. He says, you are salt and you are light. It's your identity. It's my identity. It's our nature. It becomes second nature. Now check this out. It's not just automatic. It is true in that you are a follower of Jesus, so therefore you are in the light and you become an instrument of light. You are light. Paul supports it in 1 Thessalonians. He says we are children of light. He also says in Ephesians 5, one of my favorite chapters, you and I are called to walk in love. In other words, love travels. Not only is there a sound, right, but as we travel, as we go about life, we take love with us in those spaces and in those circumstances and our relationships with those people who don't even know us. We walk and it travels with us. There's a cadence to love. There's a cadence to our behavior. And in Philippians chapter 2, we're called to shine like stars in a broken and dark world. I love this. He reminds us in John, 1 John 13, that people will actually know that we are disciples of Jesus by our love for one another. It's a factor that describes who we are. So when you encounter God, you encounter love. And when we love, others encounter God. It's a pretty big deal. So while we wait, what do we do? In this in-between time when God's good future is not fully here yet, you and I have a role and a mission. We're instruments. We have an identity to live out while we wait. So we do this. As people of light, you and I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this way, you and I are invited to interrupt this dark and broken world with divine love. It's the one massive place it's okay to be an interruption. Check that out for a second. Just think about it. You and I are called to be interruptions. Interruptions in this darkness with divine love. But how? I'm about to wrap this up. I love this. You and I participate. We move towards the brokenness. We don't move away from the brokenness. We engage, as Stan says. You practice light. You perform light. We pronounce the light. Hear that again. You and I practice the light. We perform the light. And we actually pronounce the light. It's one big activity that builds So here's just a few things to leave you with as we head out today. Love builds. It's one of the biggest things that it does. So I want you and I, maybe our call today is to live as architects of love. Who interrupt the spirit of division. In other words, you and I are designed to connect, to construct, to collaborate and build up, not to tear down. We build. Love also serves. Actually, we're oriented towards others if we are agents of life. So we serve as agents of hospitality and compassion who actually interpret the spirit of conceit that's everywhere in this world. So we build and love serves, but we also sacrifice. We're called to live as ambassadors of humility who interrupt the spirit of scarcity and insecurity. Guess what? There's enough love to go around. (laughs) There's no shortage of God's love. You, in your particular place, way, shape, or form, your vocation, your families, the people you interact with, you get to choose what that looks like as you love well. But as you love lavishly, there is no shortage. It's actually this idea of death of self, though. It's emptying ourselves, as Stan has already mentioned this morning, we pour out. Maybe one of my favorites of the whole morning is this. As we do these things, love actually creates space for other things to take place. So it builds and it serves and it sacrifices and as we do those things, we create conditions where people then pause and go, what was that? That wasn't normal. That's not what I expected. So we create space for conversation. We create space for activity. We create space for love to do what it does best. The Christian life is actually founded and, well, founded in love. Without love. I don't know what version you just looked at when you looked at 1 Corinthians 13, translation that is. And, uh, Eugene Peterson in the message at the, end, at the beginning of chapter 13 says this. He says, without love, 
you and I, the church, is bankrupt. Because it's our foundation, because it's the the glue that holds us together, if we don't have love, then guess what the church becomes? The church becomes just another religious institution that does some really good things every now and then. That's not the same thing as being a church that's on mission to be light in the world, to disrupt darkness. The greatest temptation for you and I is to withhold the love that you have access to. To withhold the love from a broken world. To withhold love from someone else who is in desperate need of it. So you and I are invited to interrupt the world with the divine love of God. That's a pretty big mission. So as we continue this conversation of light throughout the rest of December, as you come to the, hopefully you'll come to the candlelight service on Wednesday night, think about your role. Maybe think differently about the role and the mission that you have as a believer, that you're not just called just to attend worship services. You're not just called to, um, to sing songs and worship from time to time. That's all big. It's all part of it. But you are actually called to active engagement to interrupt the darkness, just as light interrupted the darkness at the very beginning. You and I, we, the church, are agents of life, of light. Won't you consider that? Glad that you've been with us this morning. The call that you and I have to live as ambassadors or agents of light is not a passive one or an easy one. There's nothing easy about calling someone to into this kind of love that Christ has divined for us. It's pretty powerful. It guides our actions. It leads us to others. It orients us towards others. It's actually this really tangible, real tangible proof, this, this care and this healing that we participate in is evidence, if you will, that we are a part of something bigger. In fact, I might argue this. I might argue that the world doesn't even expect this. That the world anticipates hate and hostility and violence. Stan um, transitioned our sermons with a a statement or a a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And that statement actually came out of his one of his most famous sermons called "Loving Your Enemies." After um, I believe his name was Joshua Reeves um, that was executed in 1958. Once you listen to the entire quote, uh, Jeremiah Reeves, returning hate for hate multiplies hate. Adding deeper darkness to the night that already is devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. You are a part of something much bigger. And I want us to end on this prayer, if you don't mind. This prayer is a prayer attributed to uh, St. Francis of Assisi. Probably did not write it, but that's okay. Um, It's a beautiful message. So here's what I'd love for you to do. I'm going to read the pieces that are in white. And if as a church body, when you see a yellow word or phrase pop up, if you will say that in unison. Is that okay? All right, here we go. It's called Instruments of Peace. Lord, make us instruments of peace, of your peace, where there is hatred, where there is injury, where there is doubt, where there is despair, where there is darkness, And where there is sadness, O divine master, grant that we may not so much as seek to be consoled as to, to be understood as to, to be loved as to. For it is in giving that, it is in pardoning that we are, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. May you be instruments of love and peace as you go out into this broken world. Pray with me. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for inviting us to be divine interruptions with you on this mission to interrupt the dark powers and the darkness that exists in this world. May we shine like stars in this brokenness. May we be people who build. May we be people who serve. May we be people who sacrifice with this love, Father, and create space for your Holy Spirit to be at work. Thank you for leading us. Thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name and through the power of your Holy Spirit that the whole church says, amen.